So welcome everyone to the GDP uh, measurement and uncertainty session. My name is Kevin Lee and we've got three papers in the session. There's a um, paper by James Mitchell, Robert Kent Smith and then myself. Um, as always, we've got 20 minutes or so for the presentation and then there will be some time for questions at the end of each presentation. So if you have questions, can I ask you to uh, write these down using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you want to write the question or just write down your name and say that you want to speak and then we'll collect questions, collect questions at the end. So we'll get straight going, get, get on with it with um, James Mitchell speaking on communicating data uncertainty. So James, let me pass over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you can uh, see my um, share screen here. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll carry on, <laughs> hoping you can. Um, I mean, as you can see, what I'm going to be talking about today is some, in fact, as I shall explain, um, very much ongoing work uh, that I've been carrying out jointly with Anna Galvao and uh, Johnny Runge um, on the trying to understand how the public understand in particular GDP data as presented to them in, in the format um, commonly used uh, by the ONS when they do put out their headline GDP data re um, releases. Um, so just to give um, some recent-ish um, um, examples, um, when statistical offices um, uh, communicate in their headline press um, releases, data releases, um, their latest um, GDP estimates. As we can see, practice varies, you know, perhaps a little bit across the three statistical institutes I'm, uh, I'm sh uh, showing you here. Um, but as can be seen, all three of these statistical institutes, and this is a practice shared more widely across other national statistical um, institutes, the statistical office uh, invariably chooses to uh, lead with a presentation of a communication of the, the latest GDP number as a single valued number, as a point estimate. So as we can see here, the ONS is saying GDP grew by 0.5 in the, in the first quarter. Similar uh, single valued point estimates reported by Statistics Canada and the BEA in the United States. Uh, in fact, if you sort of start to read the uh, these headline press releases a little more carefully, you can in fact see that the ONS provides uh, implicitly or to, to an extent some uh, uh, impression of data uncertainty around that estimate of 0.5 by at least talking about that this being a GDP estimate. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that in fact Statistics Canada and BEA don't even give this more qualitative impression of data uncertainty. But of course, as we um, um, all know, not, not least is the future, of course, uncertain, but so is the past. Um, as, as we certainly all know, um, historic economic data are un often uncertain, you know, due to, of course, sampling and non-sampling errors. Given the, you know, unsurprising uh, uh, um, desire for institutions like the ONS to put out timely data, Inevitably, there's some sort of trade-off between timeliness and accuracy, and in pushing out that more timely data, some errors, understandably, um, are associated with those, certainly those, those earlier um, estimates. Um, and so, of course, we all know this, um, and policymakers, of course, uh, have widely, are, are also very aware of data uncertainties, and, and there's a big sort of academic literature and, and policy literature on how these sorts of historical data uncertainties affect uh, policy making. But despite this, uh, you know, well understood, well, you know, good understanding of data uncertainty by statistical offices, and should we say more or expert or frequent users of, of economic data, in particular GDP data, as we just saw, when the statistical offices push out those headline press releases, they focus in on the point number or as we saw with the ONS, perhaps at best, a point estimate. So, you know, this 
begs the question, and this is very much the motivation of, of, of this uh, ESCO supported um, um, project, when in our application here, the UK public read the ONS uh, data release, um, this may well be communicated to them via a third party, such as, you know, what, what they read on, uh, on Twitter or via the BBC website, but when they're presented with this point estimate, do they take the data at face value? Or do they infer their own error magnitude subjectively around that estimate? So that estimate of 0.5 that I presented, do the public really think, well, they're saying it's 0.5, it's exactly 0.5. Or do they somehow subjectively go, oh, they mean it's around 0.5. Do they get as far as implicitly forming some sort of confidence interval around that estimate? Well, of course, we don't, um, we don't know. And so, as I say, this is very much the motivation of this uh, project was to, con to conduct some empirical experimental research to try and understand if and how the UK public do interpret and perceive GDP point estimates as presented to them by the ONS and if and how different ways of communicating and visualizing the uncertainty around that GDP estimate affect the public's perceptions and understanding of data uncertainty. And so our work does pick up on calls in particular from uh, Charles Mansky and also some joint work Anna Gavau and I undertook with uh, Anna Martha van der Bless and David Spiegelhalter calling for both in economics and in wider interdisciplinary context for, for more empirical experimental research of the type we carry out in um, this paper. And just in passing, it's, it's, it's of note <laughs> that uh, this sort of use of experimental surveys to understand how the public react to information, of course, echoes uh, uh, also recent literature which has looked into how central bank communications affects, for example, publics, the public's um, in understanding or expectations of inflation. So what do we do in this paper? So uh, in this, this project, we conduct, in fact, now via two waves, as I'll go on to explain to you shortly, we conduct randomized controlled online experiments to assess, firstly, perceptions of uncertainty in the single value GDP um, numbers as, as typically uh, presented to the public by the uh, statistical office. And we'll look at how the public's interpretation and an understanding of uncertainty uh, is affected by communicating uncertainty information in different both qualitative and more quantitative ways. And finally, you know, we will see does communicating of uncertainty effect the trust in the data and the producer of these data. I mean, as we all know, there have been, uh, you know, concerns uh, uh, you know, in the past, uh, or indeed in the present, that perhaps communicate, if a statistical office or any producer of data kind of owns up to the uncertainty and the data up front, will that lead to the public just sort of doubting the credibility of the data from the outset? And, um, and so I think this is uh, it's an important uh, aspect of the project is to see, well, you know, you know, as an econometrician, I'm always a great fan of communicating uncertainty because, you know, if, if we can quantify that uncertainty, surely providing more information to the user is a good thing. However, you know, the flip side of that may be that it could erode trust and the credibility of the data. Um, to give you a kind of a preview of the results, I mean, it's a short presentation, so no doubt I'll run out of time and not be able to get into um, everything. We do find that the majority of the UK public understand that there is some uncertainty inherent in GDP point estimates as communicated to them uh, via the, by the ONS. Um, however, we do find that communicating uncertainty information improves the public's understanding of this data uncertainty. It, you know, it does encourage them not to uh, uh, sort of project what Mansky calls sort of incredible certitude into the point estimates. They don't take the GDP point estimates at face value. And, but importantly, communicating this un uncertainty information, and this echoes a small but growing wider interdisciplinary literature, that communicating the data uncertainty does not seem to erode uh, or you know, decrease trust in the, in the ONS or the data themselves. And indeed, we find it's especially helpful to communicate and visualize uncertainty in a more quantitative vo form via some sort of confidence interval or, or fan chart type um, format. Okay, so that's sort of where we're going and I've given you a preview of our results, but how do we try and uh, test um, if and how um, 
uncertainty information when communicated in different ways to the public affects their understanding and interpretation of that information. Um, well, as I uh, intimated earlier, we've now conducted two waves. Um, I don't think we're planning <laughs> a third wave. Um, um, conducted two waves of our survey. Um, as you can see from the slides here, we conducted the first wave, in fact, at the tail end of, of 2018, so in the <laughs> pre-pandemic -pandem world. Um, and back then we um, surveyed online just over 3,000 nationally representative members of the UK public um, via this uh, randomised online um, um, survey. Um, but very aware, you know, even at the time, um, obviously we couldn't predict what, what, what back in the end of 2018, what, what, was, what was coming in, uh, in early 2020, the, the pandemic, but very aware that, that the public's understanding of uncertainty may, may well depend on the climate, both the economic climate, climate the nature of the business cycle, but perhaps more, more generally uh, perceptions about, about the political environment. Um, we very recently, just in the last couple of weeks, so some of the results I present on wave two uh, are indeed quite preliminary, we undertook a uh, second wave survey focused in on the ONS's GDP estimates the second quarter of 2020. So of course, very much uh, picking up this, uh, this large decline in GDP that we've um, just experienced. And so we've got two different sort of environments. The, the survey conducted around GDP estimates in wave one, which were, were sort of positive, sort of when the economy was trundling along as sort of business as usual. And we've, let's say, repeated effectively the same survey. We've added in a few extra uh, 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 questions, but it's repeated the same, in essence, repeated the same survey now during the pandemic period. And in both surveys, both wave one and wave two, um, how we structure the design of the survey is that the GDP data are communicated to our trial control group, G1, keep it sort of, <laughs> not going to be uh, many things that I hope you can remember as I talk today, but trying to remember the different groups. Um, the data are communicated to the individuals in the trial control group, effectively mimicking those headline press releases that I showed um, at the up front in this um, presentation. But then in uh, uh, we su subsequently, um, for treatment groups two through eight, in wave two present alternative ways of communicating and visualizing the data uncertainty to randomly selected different groups of the, uh, of, of the UK public that complete the online survey. And obviously this, it's gonna be this randomization that is critical in letting us uh, identify the causal effects of the different treatments. In other words, G1, the control group are presented with in effect the latest ONS press release at the time of running the survey. But then the other groups, five in wave one, seven in wave two, are presented with alternative visualization or communication tools, different ways of communicating, in effect, the same information, but adding on, adding in a, uh, extra detail on the uncertainty associated with the GDP estimates. And then having randomly split the, the, the sample into these different, um, different groups, about 500 members of the, of the public in each group. We then proceed with the survey and, and see how uh, respondents' uh, responses, how their outcomes about their perceptions of the uncertainty in GDP, about their understanding of the causes of data revisions and trust in the data producer, how these outcomes are affected by, by the treatment. So say what's crucial here, of course, as we know with these randomized controlled trials is the randomization because that lets us identify the causal effects of different ways of communicating uncertainty information. Um, we do collect, um, you know, it's initially about sort of 10 questions which elicit some sort of information on individual characteristics of the, of the public. And indeed we do, after a little test, um, remind respondents of what, um, GDP is. I'm not going to say with time type much about these individual characteristics in uh, the presentation today because I'm going to focus in on what we can identify a causal effect of, namely these different ways of communicating the uncertainty information. Again, it's something that I can't get into today, but um, Anna and I have written this up in a separate study. Um, we did also undertake a separate 
a non-randomized survey of experts, of frequent users of economics data to try and get at the fact that perhaps there are heterogeneities, as I touched on earlier, between how, between, uh, how people perceive uncertainty and interpret uncertainty depending on the, the type of, of, of user. Okay, so as I say, both of the two waves um, at the time of running um, uh, asked the public about their impressions uh, of data uncertainty around the latest GDP um, estimate. So for wave one, this was the GDP estimate in the third quarter of 2018, a point estimate of 1.5%. Uh, these are year on year growth rates. And for wave two, as I said, run, run around the most recent quarterly estimate of GDP, this was the year on year point estimate of, of minus 21.7%. But of course, as we all know, while the um, ONS you know, push out this point estimate of GDP, and indeed, if you sort of dig into their website, do provide a lot of information on the revisions properties of GDP, um, indeed make available, which is a great resource, the real-time data vintages, they do not explicitly quantify GDP um, data uncertainty. So in sort of designing and running this survey, uh, we as, as sort of, <laughs> we have quantified the data uncertainty ourselves. But in, do, in so doing, we're very much uh, echoing what the Bank of England do in their fan charts for GDP growth, which of course don't just quantify uncertainties about future GDP, but uh, quantify those uncertainties about past historic GDP too. So we're going to characterize GDP data uncertainty as a Gaussian, as a normal distribution, and we're going to center this density on the ONS first release, so the estimate of 1.5 or minus 21.7, and we're going to set the standard deviation of that Gaussian density equal to the historical standard deviation of revisions over the subsequent um, four years. So in other words, we are capturing what Mansky has called transitory data uncertainties. As you can see, we're not uh, quantifying permanent uh, data uncertainties or indeed any sort of conceptual uncertainties that users might have about GDP. I repeat, so we're going to assume knowledge of this true <laughs> objective DGP when communicating uncertainty information to the public. And in effect, one test of how good the different communication tools are is how successful are the public when presented with some visualization or impression of the data uncertainty, how well do the public do at, uh, at, at reading back at what, what in fact is, um, uh, of recalling what is in fact presented um, to them. Okay, so what are the um, communication tools? Um, so James, can I yep. just interrupt? So you had about 20 minutes, or yep. came on for 20 minutes. I've let it go on because nobody's Put any questions in the Q and A. Yeah. But if you if you wrap up in the next five minutes, yeah, that's good. About five minutes for for questions at the end. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. That's good. Um, so say we've got a um, variety of communication tools. Um, say Group One, the control group, are presented with the typical ONS press release. Um, then Groups Two through eight, just got five of them up on this slide, are increasingly told more information about the uncertainty around that GDP point estimate. So groups two and three are given, a more qu given additional qualitative information on the uncertainty around that point estimate. Uh, indeed, group four, reflecting what the ONS did in the second quarter of, of 2020, are given a, 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 a sort of a COVID a qualitative impression of uncertainty. But then groups five, I'm flicking forward, Groups six, seven, and eight are presented with alternative uh, and perhaps more complete impressions of the uncertainty, quantitative uncertainty around the GDP estimate, as I say, based on the uh, revisions analysis of GDP that, that we as the producers of the data have, have under, undertaken. Okay, so those are the different communication tools. So we, what, obviously what we are doing is um, uh, randomly allocating the three or 4,000 members of the public into one of these different groups and then seeing how their responses to questions about their impressions of data uncertainty are affected by the specific communication tool they are given. We're going to use some probit models to test the statistical significance of these treatment effects. Let me now just quickly, um, it's only three tables so should be able to finish on time, um, run through what we um, find. So. First off, we're going to look at outcome one, 
how are qualitative perceptions of data uncertainty affected by the communication tool which the public um, receive. We get at this via these three questions which you can look at here. And so flipping to the results tables, what I'm showing here is marginal effects at the mean from these probit models with estimates in bold if statistically significant, if the treatment is statistically significant at 10%. Um, so looking at these sort of first two main columns here across the two waves, what we can see is that those individuals presented with more, more with additional uncertainty information beyond what they get in the control group are less likely to view the G GDP first estimate from the ONS as either very or fairly accurate. So it, in a sense, rightly encourages communicating uncertainty to the public, rightly encourages them not to take the GDP est point estimate at face value. Um, doesn't seem to affect their surprise in GDP too much, but certainly you know, which is almost a test of the design of our survey. So this final column is encouraging that the public do agree that, um, you know, do acknowledge the fact that when they are provided with a more complete communication of uncertainty, that, you know, they, they acknowledge that. And uh, uh, as I say, that's a sort of, in a sense, a reassuring cross-check on our survey. Secondly, perhaps this is a more uh, helpful set of, of questions. We can ask about how the public's quantitative perceptions of uncertainty are affected by the communication um, tool they are given. So looking again across waves one and two, we can see lots of negative uh, and bold numbers, particularly here in wave two. And so what's that, what is that telling us? Well, it's telling us that those individuals presented with, with quantitative impressions or, or of uncertainty um, are less likely to view the GDP estimate of 1.5 or minus 21.7 as, as very certain. So in other words, it correctly encourages the public presenting the uncertainty information to, to view the GDP point estimate as that, as a point estimate within a range of estimates. And, and in this final uh, uh, set of uh, columns, we're looking at the chance that GDP is between the intervals of 1.2 and 1.6 or minus 21.4 and minus 22. And the way we set up the survey is, is we know that the, the, true, the correct probability of GDP being within those ranges is 30%. So what we can do via the randomization in this survey is see does communicating uh, uncertainty information in these increasingly sophisticated ways as we move through group, groups two through eight, does it make the public more likely to correctly understand that the true probability of GDP between being between these intervals is indeed 30%. And as you can see, yes, indeed, um, it does. That's a very encouraging result, we think, that you know, communicating uncertainty information to the public does uh, let them accurate, more accurately uh, uh, um, um, detail or assess what the probability of GDP being between these specific intervals is. And finally, and just wrapping up in the last couple of minutes, as, as I say, whilst you know, the, the results I've presented, you know, we view to be encouraging in the sense of saying that communi by communicating uh, uncertainty information, specific, particularly quantitatively to the public, that does encourage them to view a GDP point estimate as just that, as a point estimate within a range. And it also encourages them uh, to, to correctly infer the degree of probabilistic uncertainty around the data. Does that communication of uncertainty erode trust in the ONS? Does it encourage the public to view the ONS or the government as having vested interests of there being sort of biases in data production? And in short, I mean, the big thing here is all these, uh, uh, these, these estimates are not in bold. It does not encourage uh, the public to view, to view uh, um, vested interests or mistakes at the ONS as, being, uh, as, as explaining um, the data uncertainty. So summing up, you know, we find that the majority of the public do understand there's uncertainty inherent in GDP numbers, but communicating uncertainty information improves the public's understanding of data uncertainty, as I say, encourages them not, not to take these GDP point estimates at face value, um, but importantly, does not um, erode trust in the data. It doesn't encourage uh, users to view the causes of data re re revisions to be these sort of benign influences like, uh, like vested interests. And we find it's especially helpful to communicate uncertainty information in these more quantitative um, formats. So there you go. 
Um, Shall I stop sharing, Hilda? Let me just try. Okay, I, I think that's that. Yeah, I think you can leave those up for a, yep. for a moment, James. So that was great. Um, loads of information there presented really clearly. The, I think people are often reluctant to use the Q and A button. I don't know um, if anybody wants to ask questions right now. We have um, two or three minutes. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to ask a question. You kept talking about them like the public. Like, like, and I wasn't entirely clear who who it was that you'd surveyed. So, can can you give me a sense of yep. how you how you got hold of these people and how you chose them? Yeah, um, that's an important question. As I said, in the interest of time, which <laughs> I did sort yeah. of gloss over the the uh, individual characteristics or whether individual characteristics influence the um, um, uh, perceptions of data uncertainty. Um, but in terms of how we ran the survey and who was surveyed. The, the survey was carried out by by a by third party, by a uh, research now, Dynata, who's a, a you know a professional services uh, business, um, who surveyed a nationally representative um, um, uh, set of individuals across all regions, ages, genders, and educational backgrounds of the UK population. And they also ensure that when we did the randomization into the uh, uh, six or eight groups in wave one or wave two, that each of those random allocations, well, of course, by, by definition, it should be if the randomization is indeed random, the, uh, those sort of subgroups uh, of 500 individuals are also um, nationally um, representative. But of course, you know, consistent with, <laughs> with, that, with, with what, what we know, you know the uh, educational uh, uh, etc um, uh, job status of individuals will vary greatly between those uh, uh, you know between um, individuals and that we sort of control for those in the uh, models we ran when we're analyzing the survey but that's, that's only one thing we want to do more uh, to it one thing we want to do more on is to think about um, if and how individual characteristics such as you know how frequently do people read uh, the economic news um, etc how do they influence uh, behavioral uh, uh, reactions to data uncertainty yeah. okay that's great james thanks very much i think maybe, maybe we should move on to the the second presentation so this is by robert kent smith uh, looking at a new framework for uk gdp thanks kevin i'll just uh, share my screen Okay, so hopefully people can can see and hear me. Just to check that with you, Kevin. Yeah, that's looking fine. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so a, a paper that, that takes us back um, a little while, and I'm going to talk a little bit around um, some of the history that got us to, to the paper and some of the progress that's been, been made since then. Um, that really is a little bit of a, a, a journey through um, changes in the UK national accounts over the last few years, and indeed what we can expect to see um, next. But before I um, make some progress through, just to firstly thank um, my co-author, Rachel Merrick, who, who's on the line and did a lot of the work around this but actually more broadly, um, the team right across um, economic statistics in ONS who've, who've been working on the national accounts and double deflation over the last few years, um, many of which are on the call today. Um, so I'm going to just strip it back a little bit to, to how do we compile GDP in the UK? Um, and I'm specifically going to focus on the more mature estimates of GDP. So these are not the kind of um, you know, flash kind of uh, monthly and quarterly estimates that you, you, you see in, in the news, um, you know, kind of, kind of month in, month out. These are the kind of the more mature blue book estimates, which we have a fuller range of data to come to a more, a more detailed um, and, and less uncertain um, view of the, of the figures to, to turn it back to James's presentation. So we measure GDP in, in three different ways or, or three different approaches. Um, so we, we use the production or output approach, which measures everything that's produced in the economy. Um, the expenditure approach, um, which looks at the money spent or the final expenditures within the economy. And the income approach, which looks at the, the factors of, of income, so the wages and salaries and company profits at a very broad level. 
And in these more mature estimates in nominal terms, we balance these using the supply and use framework. So this looks at the economy at a 114 products and industry level, um, looks to compare and contrast some of the strengths and weaknesses in the various data sources across the three measures of, of GDP, and arrive at a balanced estimate in, in, in current price or nominal terms. And then we deflate that generally using um, the GDPE or the expenditure deflators, which heavily relies on consumer price data um, as an input to creating those deflators. And of course, there's also a volume measure of GDP using the output or production approach. And here we align that to the expenditure, um, making adjustments to, to the services sector. And those adjustments are, are not done in a particularly sophisticated way. They're generally raked across service industries. Um, uh, and that's the way that the GDP has been produced in the UK going back to the, the mid 90s in terms of uh, or early 90s in terms of the more mature estimates. And this is where we were before before BB19 or, or the 2019 Blue Book. Um, and this is, is kind of where we were. So there are some advantages here in that we pull on different sources of current price data, um, but some challenge that perhaps we're not making the full use of all the deflator or price data that we have available. So we plan to make some really quite big changes in, in Blue Book 19. Indeed, we did make some big changes, but we perhaps didn't quite get as far as, um, as we would have liked. Um, so this paper um, outlines some of the reasons for that and some of the things that we, we have done about it. So, so what is it that we actually planned? So looking through GDP through the, the production or, or output lens, um, very simply, we look at the output of things that are produced, um, kind of step one here, take away the, um, the, the intermediate um, goods and services that are used in the production of that good, and then adjust for inflation um, or, or price change using a, a deflator. And we actually plan to make changes through all three steps of this process. So in, in output, um, we introduced a new survey um, called the Annual Survey of, of Goods and Services. Some of you might have heard of it as Servcom. So again, prior to Blue Book 19, we assumed that, that, that generally businesses focused on their predominant source of activity. So if you were a, um, you know, a, a lawyer, we presume that you only produce law services. Actually, um, when we look at some of the detail, we see that some of this is, is quite different. Um, so the annual survey of goods and services actually showed that um, when, when we take services as a whole, 20% of the activity of the service sector is outside the product that you would most associate with that industry. So when you're thinking about applying um, price data to this, that's actually really important because you might be applying a price that isn't actually appropriate or relevant um, to, to, to what you're trying to, to capture. Similar improvements were made on, on the input side or, or intermediate consumption side. So here we, um, we have data from the annual business survey, but that's at quite an aggregated level. Um, and back in 2004, the ONS um, stopped the annual purchases survey. We since reintroduced that survey um, and Bluebook 19 took on that, that data and gave us a, a really much more granular understanding again of, the, of the, the diverse nature of inputs into the production of goods and services. Um, and this, will, this enabled us to make sure that we're applying the right price data throughout. And in terms of prices, we plan to make not only improvements to our price data, but also to confront and reconcile um, prices that come from the different measures or approaches to GDP. And as part of that, um, we, we also introduced or, or plan to introduce um, you know, double deflation. Um, so, so some would argue that the UK, UK GDP is already double deflated in the sense that the expenditure approach to GDP is the lead approach. And in that approach, and the fact that you're measuring final goods and services mean that, that some of these double deflation factors are taken account of. But this is not present in the industry breakdown of GDP that comes through the production measure. So what is double deflation? So here we go back to, to, to the equation that we saw, we saw earlier. Um, and at its very basic level, it's the order in which we do the steps. So the, the pre blue but 19 approach is to take outputs here of, of a car, take away um, a good or service that was input into the production process here an engine and then adjust for price change using the price of the car. What double deflation does is take the the car in nominal terms and adjust for the price of the car, take the engine in nominal terms, adjust for the price of the engine 
and taking the two together, then you you take one away from the other to get to to GVA um, for for a specific industry of interest. So that's broadly what we plan to do through through Blue Book nineteen, um, and we plan to do this using an approach called the H approach. So this is recommended in the the UN's um, Supply Use Input Output Handbook. Um, but it is a fairly new approach and, and, and the number of countries that are, are fully using this uh, are fairly limited. So this diagram talks through the, the, the top part of the H. Um, so the H is kind of a, a reflection um, of, the, of the schematic that's used to, to reflect the approach. Um, what we start with is a current price supply use table. So we already have this in the UK in purchases prices. It's an important part of how we compile GDP at the moment. Um, but most importantly, some of the transactions in that table are valued at purchases prices and others are at basic prices. So when you come to, to um, deflate, you actually you actually have some inequalities built into the process. So what a key part of, of this does as we move down down the kind of left, left part of the H is actually reallocate some things. So it reallocates taxes and subsidies on products, trade and transport margins, and imports of goods and services are, are removed um, from, from, from domestic, um, from, from, from the output. Um, and what this gives us um, is a supply use table that's all on the same valuation basis. So here it's a, it's a basic prices. And what that means is you can actually use a common deflator across all goods and services. So the, the price of the car is common and is the same whether you're a, a household um, buying it or whether you're a business selling it. Um, because all the things that make those those price difference, like margins, like like taxes and subsidies, have been reallocated elsewhere in the table. So that means you can produce a supply use table in previous year's prices, which is a building block to to volume GDP. Um, actually, with comparative ease, and uh, providing your current price supply use table is balanced, all of the tables that follow will be balanced as well using this method and approach. Um, we then need to do the opposite of what we did um, on the left part of the H in the right part of the H, and that's to reallocate um, the various adjustments that we made back to, um, to get a previous year price table in, in purchases prices. Now, that's all very reliant on using basic price deflators. So here, the producer price index and service producer price index in the UK. Um, but we also know we have some really high quality consumer price deflators um, that come from, from the CPI. Um, in, in terms of source data. And you can play these into the process by using them as part of the balancing, the balancing approach. Um, so you can say, well, actually, the, the CPI suggests something different. So that transition on the left-hand side between uh, basic prices and purchases prices, you might tweak some of the steps in that process so that you're making use of the, of the consumer price data. Um, this is quite a busy and complicated diagram. Um, I can assure you the reality is a lot more complicated than the diagram. So each of these arrows um, of transition between the tables actually reflects 14 different sets of supply and use tables um, at 114 product and industry dimension. So actually this is a really complicated um, operation both computationally and also from an analysis perspective um, to understand exactly what's what's going on and if you see a number that might look a little bit unusual or odd to trace it back and to understand exactly what the cause was of that. Um, so there's a, a really important part in understanding what, what difference this makes that we I've kind of not introduced up until now. Um, and I've kind of used the term GDPO and GDPP a little bit interchangeably. So the production measure of, of GDP or GDPP in the UK, at least pre blue but 19, was only ever compiled in current prices because that's where it was needed for the supply use table. And it was based on the annual business survey and other sources to measure measure value added or the, or the contribution to each um, of each industry to GDP and was used to confront the three approaches to GDP in the current price supply use framework. But really, really, really importantly, it had no role in compiling the um, GDPO estimates or the published GDPP estimates as you Oh, it looks like we've lost um, lost Rob there, Kevin. Yes, he suddenly went very quiet. <laughs> see if we can get him rejoined.
In the meantime, while we're finding out, there is a question came in for James just after his um, talk. So maybe we could address that while we wait for Rob to try and find Rob again. Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a, that's a good idea. On, on the, um, yeah, but, um, the timing of it meant that I, I missed it. So this is Keshab. Um, hopefully, James, you're still around. Yes, I am. Don't um, worry. I've not, not dropped off my lines yeah. holding up. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe uh, Keshab could ask his question. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kevin. I mean, this is a very simple question. So you have mentioned that uh, I, I had never heard that uh, GDP. We should be very cautious about uh, uh, taking the figure. I always uh, took the view that whatever ONS has published and uh, those are the final figures. But uh, in econometrics, they used to say that uh, there is a data generating process. Whatever realized uh, data we see uh, is uh, one of the thousands uh, are the, from the distribution. That is what I study. Um, my impression was that. So, so are you implying for your analysis that uh, we should be very cautious uh, taking the interpreting the GDP data set, even the growth rate? When, when say, government says the economy grew by this much and that much, I don't know how much uh, faith we should put in those figures. Um, yeah. I can see Rob's back, but let's, maybe perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll quickly answer that question yeah, and then let you, ahead. Then ahead, let you carry on, Rob, just so uh, yeah. <laughs> give me a second to get ready, Rob. Um, <laughs> no, so, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, of course, you know, the statistical offices and, and one would hope informed users, and there is a large academic literature on this, have long been aware that and national account statistics like GDP are measured with uh, error. So it's, uh, I say, always been known they're based on samples after, after, after all. So the, um, I think we've always known that we should interpret GDP point estimates as an estimate measured with some um, uncertainty. Um, however, in, in a sense, ref reflecting the, the, uh, your, your question, what we sought to do in our specific study was, was test that. Yes, we would hope informed users and producers of data know that GDP data, for example, are measured with uh, error, but do the public know that? So that, of course, is, is very much what we sought to test out um, in our survey. Okay, well, let me um, okay. quick, quick, quickly stop there and let, let Rob run. Very good, James. <laughs> okay, welcome back, Rob. Um, um, Hi, sorry about that. That was uh, my, my own fault. Um, <laughs> with, uh, with, with a laptop that I'm not used to, but um, let me uh, share my screen again. Okay. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully, back with you. Um, back with you now. Yeah, that's um, good. Yep. Yeah, so the so the key point of which you may or may not have heard is that the production approach to GDP actually plays no role in the in the production of, of headline GDPO. Um, so it, it's used in the supply use framework, but it's not used in headline GDPO. Um, so, so that kind of begs the question, well, what, what is GDPO that we see when we when we go on the, the ONS um, website? Um, so actually it's based on the monthly business survey. So it's based on what we use in our short term estimates of GDP. Um, so basically a monthly business survey deflated sales. Um, that gives a different number in, to GDP, uh, to, to the expenditure approach or the headline approach in our more mature estimates. So they're aligned using services, using adjustments raked across services. And this will be really important as we move through. So this is a, a really key point in terms of changes that we can expect to see um, to, to UK GDP in the coming period. So where did we get to in, in, in Blue Book 19? So the top half of the slide summarizes um, you know, what we did pre Blue Book 19, which is the things I've just talked you through. Um, I'll just change this a little bit. Hopefully you can see that better. Um, so where did we get to? Well, actually we implemented the annual survey of goods and services, the purchases survey. So they're really essential building blocks to double deflation. Um, and we also confronted for the first time double deflated GDPP, and the expenditure approach um, through the supply use framework for the first time and benefited from that confrontation in the production of GDP. Of GDP. But we didn't go as far as aligning the deflated sales through GDPO to expenditure, um, to, to expenditure. 
um, and, and really allowing that confrontation to feed through in the GDPO measure. Um, and we left that as it was, it was a step too far. And, and you'll see why as we move through some of the graphs, why we had some uncertainties over that data and why we felt we needed just a bit more time to understand what was going on beneath the surface. So this is where we get into the meat of, of the paper itself. And this shows some, some charts that were there from the um, intermediate stages of the production of the 2019 Blue Book. Um, so here you can see um, three lines. So the top line is, is what I've called the theoretical application of the H approach. So that's following that top half of the H round as I described, but without doing any of that reconciliation um, using using some of the, the, the supply side, uh, sorry, the, the demand side deflators. Um, and then you see the numbers that we published in for GDP in Blue Book 18, and the numbers for Blue Book 19, which are of course much closer together. Um, and what you see is, is that the rate of GDP growth is a lot slower um, in the run up to the financial crisis through that theoretical application of the H approach. So when you put more weight on producer prices than you do on consumer prices, you get a slower rate of, of GDP growth. Um, which, which was really interesting to us to understand exactly why, um, exactly why that might be the case. Um, so actually, when you go back then and look at the, the price data that underlies this, you get pretty much the same chart um, you know, with, with some differences. But what's really interesting to us in both charts is this kind of divergence in, in the message that we see between the 2007 and 2009 period. So in later years, we, we have charts that look much closer together. And in early years, you have charts that look much more divergent. Um, and, and a big question that, that we had is, is why? Um, and there are a number of, of kind of hypotheses, and I suspect the, the reality is, is somewhere in the middle. Um, so one, obviously the financial crisis happened around this point, maybe there was some genuine change in economic relationships, um, that, that, that's a, a theory. Um, there are also big changes to international standards at this time. So um, the new industrial and product classification came in in this 2007-09 period um, with a lot of data mapped to a new classification. So that in itself might be interesting. Um, at the same time, we also moved the, to for people who use some of our data sources from the annual business inquiry to the annual businesses survey. Now that's the backbone for the production of PPIs and the weights for PPIs that happened around the same time as well. Um, and also ONS went through a, a period of modernization and, and transformation at this point as well. Um, and there's a potential that some things got lost in, in, in historic um, knowledge through, through system changes and, and everything else. So we felt that we couldn't fully reconcile this position until we would explored the, these reasons a little bit more. And um, we couldn't revise GDP on the back of what we'd, what we'd seen so far. Um, another approach that we, or another challenge that we, we felt here is actually some imbalances in current price GDP. Um, so here's a, an example for, for just an illustrative product, uh, sorry, in, illustrative industry, industry 74, um, professional scientific and technical activities. Um, and here you can see the income and production GVA approach. And you can see that there is some, some not insignificant divergence between them and, and the decisions that you make around how you balance um, actually has quite profound implications for then which deflator you use and then a, an impact on, on headline GDP. So here you can see the balance view. Um, you know, generally here we're balancing towards income, which is, is generally more in line with, with what we, we do with some of this um, and, and this approach. Um, because in current prices, we think the income data is 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 um, you know is, is of higher quality um, in terms of it being tax data, and where there are some divergences from that data, that's based on other sources that we look at to bring to bear as well um, to to QA and confront that tax data. So that that just gives an indication for a, for a stylized industry. So we've done quite a lot of work um, since since Blue Book 19, um, and a couple of things we have um, looked to improve some of our deflators, and hopefully you've seen my my colleague Richard Hayes talk about telecoms uh, yesterday. I think um, as part of the conference, um, we've you know gone back and looked at the results, and we've kind of found that there is some some of the explanation the wedge can be explained with with um, some, some 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 proper and and real statistical reasons. But the majority of it remains unexplained. So we come back to a question of, of what do we think is the higher quality data? Is it some of those consumer prices or is it some of those producer prices? And on balance, we think it's the consumer prices. The challenge is if you use those consumer prices in the H approach, it becomes very, very, very complicated to produce an estimate of GDP that you've got faith in. So I talked about 14 sets of supply use matrices, each with 114 products. 
um, needed to kind of tweak individual cells to get an outcome that looks like using the CPI. So we've now moved to a, a, a kind of new approach, and this is this is the, what we, we have kind of outlined in a, in a more recent paper um, that actually says let's just just simplify this process a little bit a little bit more and actually probably produce higher quality estimates in the process. So rather than def than going through all the the challenge of, of moving things to a constant price basis, we use um, the most appropriate deflator for the transaction of interest. So for um, output and intermediate consumption, generally we use PPI deflators. For household expenditure, generally we'll use CPI derived def deflators. And we'll, we'll deflate moving directly from left to right, not, not kind of progressing our way around the H. Um, and that enables us to, 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 to make best use of all the price information that we have available. But it does mean that we miss one of the really nice things about the H approach, which is when you, you follow the H around, everything's balanced and you've got no more work to do. Um, so here we go through and then reconcile some of the differences that we get in previous year's prices, looking at the current price, looking at the deflators, doing additional analysis by industry, looking at other sources um, and coming to, to a view in the round. And what's really important here is this is the approach that's adopted, that's followed by most um, by most countries in terms of the way that they produce double deflation. Um, so you know, we think that the H approach generally works works well is a, a nice conceptual framework, um, but we have some reservations about whether it's it's ever suitable for use in a in a, a production context, particularly in NSI like like the ONS where actually we have um, really significant revisions. Um, and methodological changes and improvement introduced to every single annual round. Um, a number of other countries would would store them up and do them every five years. Um, and, and we think that the, the trade-offs there are, are, are really quite challenging. So what does this mean for, so for can where- I, Can I ask you to, Rob, can I ask you to begin to wind up? And I've got, if you talk for another couple of minutes, you'll have five minutes for the questions that have been asked. Great. Okay. So I think we are we are coming to an end. So what happens um, through through the experimental estimates we've got planned in October and Blue Book 21? So we'll increase. So basically, we'll we'll do all the things that we did in Blue Book 19 and Blue Book 20. But now GDPO will come will be benchmarked to GDPP, and that will lead to some really significant changes in in industry distribution of GDP. But importantly, because, because we're still putting a lot of reliance on the higher quality expenditure deflators, which are already double deflated, um, you won't necessarily see big revisions to GDP. Um, and this is, you know, we've been working quite closely with Nick Alton and Martin Will on this, something that, that they call the invariance principle, um, which because, you know, this is a, a redistribution amongst industry GDP rather than it is changes to, to headline. So what will be the, um, the the sources of this revision? So better current price data. So rather than using the monthly business survey, we'll be using some of that um, annual business survey, which benefits from bigger samples and more conceptually pure data. We also get changes from double deflation. And we'll also get changes from reconciling and confronting the um, GDP production data with the GDP expenditure data. So all in all, better quality estimates of GDP both at an industry level and double deflated, meeting one of the, the long held ambitions of, of the ONS and one of the key parts of the Bean review. So what impact do we expect double deflation to, to have? Um, so we're still working through this and, and we're not kind of, um, you know, in a, we're not kind of revealing anything here through, through the work so far, but this is just some of the theoretical, um, you know, impacts of double deflation. Um, so really key is is where prices might not move in sync in synchronization with each other and oil is a really important example so in a country like the UK where um, we're a net importer of oil um, the price of intermediate consumption if there was a, an oil shock that, that, that led oil to go up would increase faster than the price of output so if current price intermediate consumption is deflated by an output price index the price of intermediate consumption will be understated. So the volume of intermediate consumption will be overstated. Um, it follows that the estimate of volume GVA will be understated um, in this way compared to if it had been deflated by an appropriate deflator for all products. So this gives us a negative bias um, for that specific industry, but this is a bias in industry allocations of GDP, not headline GDP estimates. Um, so we see this as a, a, a reallocation to better um, you know, show the supply chain impacts through the economy 
rather than a change that's that's going to impact headline GDP. So just to conclude, um, so so what's next? We'll see experimental estimates on the 2nd of November. Um, we will see some changes to reflect some improvements we've made to clothing and telecom deflators in the national accounts, but generally, other than that, it will just be around the really interesting industry profile that we see that we'll, we'll have some differences. We'll seek feedback on that. This isn't the finished product. This is, does this look sensible? Are there areas where, where people think we need to do more work? And then in Blue Book 21, we'll integrate that feedback plus the experimental results into the 21 Blue Book, and this will become, become uh, a headline measures of GDP. But the work won't be finished there. Um, you know, we've identified that there's lots to do around the reconciliation of GDP and further improvements to deflators, as I, th I think my colleague Richard outlined yesterday. So this is this is kind of you know double deflation tick job done, but actually still a really ambitious program to continue to continually improve the quality of, of GDP and specifically the industry breakdowns of GDP to help us through the productivity puzzle. And uh, that takes us to the end. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. That's Fantastic. It, it's sort of, it's very reassuring to see the care that goes into every stage of this. For, for the end user like myself, it's fantastically reassuring. So, um, anyway, we've got time for a couple of questions. One from uh, Keshab and then Anna wanted to um, ask, ask something. So, can we have Keshab again? Oh, thank you. Mm, thank you for this. Um, uh, it is quite interesting and illuminating uh, one. I have been using this supply and ease table for a long time uh, and to, uh, to do the dynamic general equilibrium model of the UK economy. So my understanding was that uh, you have uh, first the GDP measure in the factor prices uh, before you put the value added taxes and the input like that. That was the process. We have the intermediate input and then value added taxes and uh, imports. And then the other side, you have the final demand. So, and uh, on top of final demand, you can put the all uh, indirect taxes and then the households have the kind of different type of tax, income tax. That was the kind of uh, uh, step we are taking. What is the, uh, now the question is when you uh, adjust uh, GDP with the prices like this, what would have uh, its impact on kind of the income distribution side on the other side, households income, and also on the wages and uh, uh, operating surplus? Yeah, yeah, so that's a, a, a really good question. So we tend to think of um, the income approach to GDP, at, at obviously in current prices, because there's no, no volume um, estimate of, of income. Um, has actually been probably the most robust um, piece of piece of data that we have in in the compilation of GDP. So this comes from from tax data um, from HMRC, both on on pay as you earn and, and company profits. Um, so actually, the the answer here is probably you expect to see, see comparatively little change actually in some of that that income component, um, uh, particularly in in, in Blue Book Twenty One. Um, you know, we, but we might through the confrontation end up making some changes to the, the, the distribution underneath it because sometimes the industry distribution that is available to the, the, the tax authorities isn't quite the same distribution of, of industry that's available for statistical purposes. So that's where you might see some changes in the composition um, of, uh, of income, but we'd expect probably probably income to be to be to be quite there, and that confrontation will increase as we go through more and more blue books and iterations, and can work through more and more of the detail. So it might be that it's it's something that that moves a little bit over over coming um, years of the national accounts. Um, before we, we we settle on a on a position that makes the maximum use of not only the data we have now but the new data that's um, you know that's available to us from from an administrative perspective. I mean, uh, one one side. Okay, one... Um, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we're we're running out of time. Anna, can can you ask your question and get it answered within two minutes? Um, my my question is about balancing. So Rob just talked to us that from the income approach sometimes you can have better measures and he shows a picture that had uh, some numbers from the income approach and some numbers from the production approach so my question is is you know do we always need to have just one measure of gdp is reasonable to to actually publish different measures if we cannot balance so i think we we 
I mean, we respond to to stakeholders in in, in this. So, so I think in our in our quarterly short term estimates, we are um, very transparent, and and I, I think in comparison to some of the countries about exactly where bouncing adjustments are applied, where there are statistical discrepancies, where there's alignment adjustments, so that users can figure out for themselves where they put they put quality. Um, and I think that's where we'd you know over over a, a longer time horizon like to get to on 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 supply use GDP as well. Um, but we know that there are some things that we need to do to to better reflect the available data that we have so typically what happens is you you only balance the most recent three years in any detail um, and what we've done over this blue book um, through 2019 2020 2021 and probably 2022 and 23 is actually undertake a full rebalance through the entire time series um, and we're working through some of the things that, that might look a little odd that have, have been laid on over years. So I think, you know, in, if, if we're sat here in, in five years time, I'd like to get to a place where we where we are actually just making, you know, the, a lot of the imbalanced data available to people so that they can form some of their own judgments as well. Um, but at the moment, we think such is the complexity of, the, of some of the judgments that are there that we'd need to codify those judgments in quite a lot of detail to be able to allow people to intelligently make sense of the data um, before putting it into the public domain. So that's definitely an aspiration, um, but we're, we're probably just a little way away from that. This is great news. Just just hey. a quick thing. Okay, Have you sorry, published sorry, the methodological yeah. paper, right? Is the methodological paper published? This one you just showed to us. Yes, yeah, so it's a series of papers. Um, yeah, so the, the, there's probably three papers I've covered here, but they're all in the public domain. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay, thanks very much, Robert. Um, I guess I should get on with my own presentation now. So I'm going to try and share my screen. And can I check? Are you, are you seeing what I hope you're seeing? Um, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a paper that's um, looking at uh, measuring output expectations and uncertainty and looking using these measures of expectations and uncertainty in the study of um, business cycle dynamics in the UK. So I'll start with a, a statement of the obvious, which is that um, so actual movement that movements in actual variables are very very uh, much influenced by movements in expectations that's been known you know that's well known in economics but there has been this recent surge in interest in behavioral macro where there's more interest in the use of information so there's a lot of discussion about information rigidities talk about sticky information or noisy information rational intention um, lots more interested in learning and information imperfections and the way in which um, the way that people form expectations, use information in forming their expectations, the, that can itself affect um, in the case of output, output fluctuations. And there's books, texts by Evans and Honkapoya, pa important papers by Banku and Rice, Sims, Koyben and Gorodnyshenko, lots and lots of papers in that area focusing on the use of information. Um, but over and above the use of information, there's also this big interest in the broader issue of um, how, pe how people use the information that they have with the, this focus on cognitive limitations, where people use phrases like animal spirits and irrational exuberance and the use of heuristics, sentiment, and again, textbooks by Akerhoff and Schiller and de Grau uh, give that sense of how important these um, interactions between expectations and actual outcomes are. Of course, there's also been a massive interest over recent years about the role of uncertainty, both um, as a source of shocks to output, but also the way that uncertainty plays in propagating the effects of other shocks. And there's been lots of papers there. Nick Bloom's very important, but Gerardo, Liv Gibson, lots and lots of papers in the area. So. The, um, so a lot of people have, have tried to get an, an idea of business cycle fluctuations, looking at um, actual output movements and uncertainty. So and there's lots of VAR models been used there, but there's a surprisingly few that make use of survey data. I know there are there are papers that make use of survey data. Don't get me wrong, but but relatively few. If, uh, 
couple of years ago, I looked at papers in the sort of five or six big journals on forecasting, and people, only half of the papers that are interested in forecasting output, for example, made use of direct measures of surveys that said what people thought output was going to be. So it, massively underused. Very surprising, given that the direct measures of um, expected future output gives a great summary measure. If you've got full information, rational expectations, those direct measures are the best factor you can have. They tell you everything there is to know about what people, about what's going to happen to output, if you have full information, rational, rationality. And if you have anything else, if any of those information imperfections or any of those uh, cognitive limitations matter, then the direct measures are the only way really that you're going to get an idea of how important they are. So you'd think that direct measures of expectations would be there. Um, the other thing, if you've got that, the two measures of both actual output, say, and expected out, expectations of output, you can have, you can look at the effects of two different types of shocks. And it um, seems quite sort of reasonable to think that there are shocks that are driving output that are going to have a permanent effect. And then there are also shocks that everybody knows are short-lived. There's movements in output that you know it's just something that's happened now and it's almost certain to go away. And the effect of them is almost certain to go away. And if you've got actual and expected measures, that gives you a way of seeing that part that's going expected to go away, the short-lived part. You can distinguish between the, the sort of permanent parts and the, the short-lived parts of shots. Now that so that sounds important, you know, because you'll be able to get something more precise, but it's actually um, not just a, conven a more convenient thing. If you've got changes in the size of the relative size of those two types of shocks, now imagine that permanent, the, the role of permanent shocks increases during times of crisis. So you've got heteroscedasticity in the two types of shocks. That won't matter if you've got that bivariate VAR, the heteroscedasticity won't affect the parameter estimates. So you are still going to have decent parameter estimates. But if you only look at univariate, a univariate representation of output. There will be a univariate representation, but it will be a more complicated one um, than the one that you can get in the bivariate VAR. And what's more, it, it will have time varying parameters if the relative size of the two types of shock change over time. And so if you're not using the direct measures of expectations, you're only looking at actual output, you're going to get misspecification because you're not taking into account the time variation. And what's more, the time variation will be related to the size of the shocks. So you might end up finding a spurious relationship between uncertainty and the movements in actual output if you don't pay attention to the expected series. So there's three good reasons why you should use the direct measures of expectations. Also, just when you're measuring uncertainty, you would think that looking at the difference between what actually happened and what people said they thought was going to happen, that gives you a pretty direct measure of what people don't know about, say, output. And so it's a pretty direct measure of uncertainty about output. So, you know, you've got this very clear measure of output uncertainty. Um, so, as I say, people do use this, the, the whole load of papers by Kovian and Gorodnichenko, they've made these expectation series that sort of fashionable again, lots of people are looking at them. Lahiri did lots of good work on measuring uncertainty using survey data. It's an important paper by Backman just recently that's used survey data. So, so they do exist, but it's much less than you'd expect. And also they're often for the survey of professional forecasters uh, rather than outside the US. So in the UK, we do have a good source of survey data, which is the CBI survey. The uh, CBI have been running four surveys, the Industrial Trends Survey, which looks at manufacturing, distributed trades, which looks at retail and distribution, service sector, um, as obvious, financial services. Um, the, the ITS has been running since 1958. It's a very, very long data set. And in that sense, it's, it's the best because it's been, it's been going for so long. Of course, we do have the decision maker panel which is a, a more recent and a, um, uh, uh, addition 
but the, the CBI has given you a very good long run um, of, of data on this. And that people have looked at the CBI data uh, for a long while. Roy Bachelor is looking at it. James has looked at, um, at this, and Martin Whale, along with people at the Bank of England, have been looking at it for, uh, for some time. But one reason why I think the CBI survey is not used as much as it might be is because the survey is qualitative, which means that the responses are people say, what do you expect to happen? Is output going to go up, stay the same, or go down? Um, and so it's, it's a little bit harder to work with. So this paper does two things. First of all, it, it talks about a new method for converting the qualitative survey data to a quantitative one using what we call a, a meta-modeling approach. So I'm trying to promote this meta-modeling approach hard. And then we'll be looking at the, the, the link between the actual, the expected and the uncertainty measures in a reduced form VAR to try and get an idea of business cycle dynamics. And in that, we look at the three surveys, the ITS, the DTS and the um, service sector survey. We don't look at the financial sector. That's the small, that's been uh, running for the, for, uh, th that's not run as long as the other three and it has a smaller coverage and so more importantly, from our point of view, we get very coherent results from these three surveys, and it's a bit less coherent with the financial sector. So we think that this might be special. So we, we just focus on these three surveys. So I'll spend a, uh, I'll try and be quick and explain what the, what the conversion process is moving from the quantitative to the, uh, from the qualitative to the quantitative series. So the question says, uh, that the CBI asks is what has been the trend over the past three months and what the expected trends for the next three months and then um, survey participants can say um, up stay the same or down so you get um, both a backward looking version of what are the proportions of firms that said that um, the, uh, the variable is going to rise what's what proportions stay the same and what proportion are going to fall go down and then you have what happened, the backward looking one, what happened, and you also have measures of what proportion say it's going to rise, stay the same and going to fall. So you've got the backward looking part and the forward looking part. And the way to think of how, how to use that data is start with the thought, what if the average increase in output for those firms reporting a rise is alpha percent, and the average decrease for those reporting a fall is minus beta percent. Then the average this of, of the of, of average growth is uh, one over n, the number of people in the sample times the number of people are saying alpha, the sum of alpha over those same rise, plus zero times the number of people saying the same, minus beta times the number of people so, saying fall. And so there's a link between that and the proportion same rise scaled by alpha and the proportion same fall scaled by beta. Um, and of course, if you knew what the alpha and the beta was, then you could use those same alpha and betas and scale up the forward looking um, right proportions to give you a, a measure of the expectations. So the question is, what do we know about the alpha and the betas? Well, one thing, if the alpha and the beta was the same throughout the sample, and also equal, so that alpha is equal to beta, then this expression here is just, you, you've got the average measure, is just a scaled up version of R minus F, which is this balanced statistic. And that's why people often focus on the balanced statistic. You know that the average value is just moving alongside the balanced statistic. But the balanced statistic is only sort of acceptable if alpha is equal to beta, and if they're constant over time. If they're not constant over time, right, you, so alpha is not, uh, sorry, if they're, if they're not equal, first of all, alpha is not equal to beta, then you could just estimate the alpha and beta in a regression. I'll go back. So you could just regress backward looking growth on the proportions that said rise and the proportions that said fall. And that would give you a measures of the alpha and the beta that you could then use to produce your forward expectations. You could do that over the whole sample. Um, on the other hand, um, more realistically, you know that the average of uh, the increase of those saying higher, the alpha, is going to be higher 
at times of in good times and beta is going to be lower in good times and vice versa in recessions. So you don't really want the alpha and the beta to be considered to be constant over time. So what you could do, you could use a rolling sample so that you, uh, you, you choose a window size and then re-estimate the alpha and beta as you move over time, allowing the alphas and betas to be different over time and then just using it in this, in this formula again, but now with time varying alphas and betas to convert the uh, future rises and future falls into a measure of expected. So you could do that using the rolling window, or you can use the meta-modeling approach, which is sort of the, at the heart of this paper, um, which, which is, there, it's, it's a model, it's based on model averaging, but the models that we estimate um, vary uh, in, in terms of sample length. So you might estimate a model of eight quarters, a model over nine quarters, a model over 10. So instead of having this rolling window, you have a rolling model average where the, the models can be, are of different sample sizes, eight, nine, 10, maybe up to 40 quarters long. Um, and then the meta model is the weighted average of the parameters you get from those, from those um, individual models. So it's, it's just a model averaging technique, but the, we call it a meta model because we're averaging over an unusual set of models. They're models that get bigger um, by sample size rather than having different explanatory variables. And the weights depend on how well the model is performing in fitting the data. So that, this, this is an important part of the paper that I don't really have time to make a big deal about, but it's that meta model trick, um, meta modeling trick allows you to estimate these time varying alphas and betas, but it provides a lot of flexibility. You can get times of gradually evolving alphas and betas and then very abrupt changes. So it's a very um, flexible way of getting, of getting this time variation in the alphas and the betas. Very quickly, um, we can also get two measures of uncertainty from the, um, from the when we're using the direct measures. One, what we what might call the consensus measure, we look at the difference between what actually happens and what people and the expectation that we've just derived. And the size of that gives you a direct measure of the uncertainty that surrounded the variable. But the trouble is this ex post uncertainty measure is dominated by what actually happens to the, to the variable. So you can uh, go through a process where you estimate a, an arch model that explains the, um, uns the uncertainty measure and you have a time varying standard deviation from the arch model. And so you, you can use the fitted value of that estimated standard deviation as a measure of ex ante uncertainty, so it's sort of dated at time t. So th this is a, an idea that comes from Lahiri that's used a few times and um, it gives you, so it's based on this idea of the direct measures of how long you've been, but it's transformed. So it's based on it, the information that's available to you at the time. So that's one measure of uncertainty. A second measure of uncertainty captured by the, the cross-section dispersion of um, people's expectations. So we've got these individual firms that are all forming their expectations. Some of them are thinking that um, output's going to go up by alpha, some think it's going to go down by beta. So you can get a cross-section variation, which will also reflect some elements of disagreement. And so this is the formula that you're going to have for the cross-section dispersion with those alphas and betas. And that can translate again into a formula involving the um, proportions up and the proportions down. Um, and again, we can use our time varying alphas and betas to get a time varying measure of the um, disagreement measure. So again, trying to be quick, we can then estimate a reduced form VAR that uh, explains the consensus uncertainty, the disagreement measure, the expected growth and the actual growth in terms of lots of lags of those things. And um, just as a quick aside on this, notice that this term here is not a straight difference. This is the expectation minus the actual. So this is actually, although it looks like a, um, this is this actually a built-in co-integration 
between the actual series and the expected series so that any shocks to the set to the system will have um, the same effect on actual and expected series in the long run. So I've got a load of um, diagrams I want to show you here. So the, Hi Kevin, sorry, just to uh, um, update you, we've got 10 minutes until the session closes. We have got already one question in the ready, okay. so, so perhaps if you sort of wrap up in five minutes and leave five minutes for, for okay. questions. I'll, I'll Thank try you. my best. Okay. Okay, so this is the sort of data that we got. So this is a measure of the actual um, output growth in the ITS sector. And then this, this gives you an idea of the, the proportions of same fall and the proportions that are same rise. And you can see you know, that the proportion same fall went up in the global financial crisis proportion same rise. So you can see that there's some information in there straight away. But there is a question about whether the relationship between these variables and this variable is time varying, and that's the that's the thing that we're interested in. These are just the, the same uh, figures for the service sector and for the distributed trade sector. So this this um, these diagrams show you what you get if you use the different conversion techniques. So the the black line is actual output growth. This again is for the ITS. The yellow line is what you get if you just use the uh, balanced statistic so you can see it has a, a positive co a correlation with actual but it's it's just not responsive enough the orange line is what you get if you use a roll in um, the rolling window and the red line is what you get if you use the meta technique and so you can see that you you can use the cbi survey and get a really good you know a, a very high correlation between what actually happens and what the survey respondents said they expected to happen when you use this meta modeling trick. And the same was true of the uh, service sector and the distributed trade sector. And just to give you an idea of what's going on behind that figure three in the, in the meta rule, this gives you, this is a, a measure of the average sample length in the models that have been up behind the meta model. So you can see the sort of, four or five phases where um, the model um, sort of evolves and is happy to get bigger and then um, there's a structural break and you want to have a much shorter set of models and then there's no structural breaks for a while and then you want a shorter, a shorter model. So that, that's, that's the variability that's being captured by the meta modeling trick. And this, this line shows you the difference between alpha and beta which remember in the balanced statistic, this is assumed um, zero. And this just gives you an idea of the time variation in the alphas and betas that you get from the meta model and they get from the rolling forecast. And then also just as an aside, these are the, the consensus measures of uncertainty. And that first measure is the blue one. And then the disagreement measure of uncertainty is the, is the green one. That, that's based on the ITS data set. So just to try and finish with some um, idea of what we're getting from these three. So in that four variable bar, these are the effects of this. Here's some impulse responses. This shows you, again, these are all just for the ITS. We have the comparable figures for the other two, service, uh, the other two surveys. So this is what happens when there's an uncertainty shock. This is a consensus uncertainty. Um, you can see that it has an effect on both action and expected outputs, um, causes those to fall. And it has a, a per, both after what two years, both are permanently lower than they would have been in the absence of the uncertainty shock. Similar story with the disagreement shock. After uh, two years, both are permanently lower than they would have been. Um, when you have an expected output shock, the um, the impact effect of the, the one standard deviation, deviation about 0.8 um, over the longer term, you get about 60% of that impact effect um, persists um, with the actual output shocks. Um, you have a one standard deviation of about 40% of that effect um, persists into the long run. So you could say lots of things about these input responses, but um, in the interest of time, I'll just conclude by 
um, making these quick points. One, that you can use the CBI to get very good, very credible direct measures of expectations, quantitative measures, when you take into account the structural change with that meta modeling technique. Um, it's important to use the direct measures of expectations because you've got that important taking into account the, um, the effect of what, what everyone knows to be short lived shocks. So you, you know that the, this four variable VAR that includes both action and expected growth is going to perform well. You can see that there is an important interplay between the actual and expected series. Uh, it makes the point that the expected outputs, um, shocks to expected output settles to about 60% of the initial value after a year, shots to actual output 40%. Um, uncertainty has a downward effect on output, disagreement has a downward effect on output. These look small when you look at those impulse responses, but there are times when there are very large shocks to uncertainty. And so, of course, they have very large effects. So every so often, like the global financial crisis, there's a very large shock and that has a permanent effect on output that we've picked up on our bar. I should finish. Okay, um, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, that, that was all very interesting. We have got some questions that have come in um, from Anna, Martin, Kishab, and um, Bill. We do not. We only have, a, <laughs> I think, four minutes um, um, left. So um, I'll uh, ask the, uh, the people to, to speak in in that order, please. Um, in the interest of time, quick questions and have to be uh, concise answers too, please, um, Kevin. So over to you first, please, um, Anna. Uh, Kevin, just how you got the disagreement and if you have the individual um, answers of each firm in the panel? Uh, we do, but of course they're just up, down and the same. And so that, that formula that I gave with the alphas and betas um, takes into account those individual responses, but it can only do it by assuming the alphas and the betas. But of course we got decent measures of the alphas and betas by using the beta uh, by using the meta modeling technique but it is based on individual survey responses that's yeah. cool that's cool because heterogeneity is a big deal in the literature now but i'm yeah. going to be quiet yeah. and let the other people okay, uh, ask you. questions um martin um please okay the it survey includes a question on whether uncertainty is holding back investment <clears throat> have you looked at how that relates to your measure of uncertainty please um, we haven't. We haven't yet. I mean, this paper is part of a, an ESCO funded project where we've said our interest is in looking at output and business cycle fluctuations, but also paying attention to the investment decisions and inventory decisions and capacity uh, information that you get from the survey. So that's that's completely on the agenda, but we we've not finished that work yet. Thank you. Um, Kishab, please. Uh, um, Kevin, uh, you you mentioned that uh, you compare to a rolling sample window and a meta model uh, incorporating the structural change. So um, I I don't know whether I understood it correctly. Uh, is the confidence interval of the rolling window smaller than the uh, meta model? I mean, you mentioned in your uh, concluding. Uh, comment and the third point it settled down to 40 percent or 60 percent could you a little bit elaborate on that please yeah so ju just to be clear on the difference between the rolling window and the and the meta modeling I'm, both of them are rolling but the what i've called rolling has a fixed sample size whereas the meta modeling um approach allows for mod uh, choosing an average across lots of models with different sample sizes and so it has more flexibility than the rolling model and what we found is that in terms of de uh, delivering expectation series uh, that they're, they're a, a, a better fit with what actually happens so that gives you an idea that maybe the meta modeling approach is a better one than just the simple fixed sample rolling window approach I see we also have a question in from Bill Martin, but I, I'm aware that time's about to cut out on us in about 10 seconds or so. So right. perhaps we can pick that up um, in the lounge. You should be able to get it in. That should oh, be really? Fun. Oh, very good. That's excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I've been on other sessions where it abruptly ended. So, Bill, over to you, please. Thank you. Saved by the bell, then. Um, 
as a long time user of uh, the SeaGuard server, I really enjoyed your paper, Kevin. I have one uh, question about the possibility that respondents get confused, particularly during large shocks between levels and rates of change, so that when they give you the forward change in, um, in the balance or allowing for the differences in the shares of ups and downs, that in fact they're referring to the level compared to um, two quarters ago rather than the change between one quarter and another. And that was particularly apparent in some of the survey results which came out this year. So the respondents were saying that there's going to be a very large fall in Q3 in addition to the very large fall in Q2. Uh, but in fact, what they meant uh, was that output would actually um, be um, recovering in Q3, but it would still be below that in Q1, if you see what I mean. I do see what you mean, yeah. yeah. So I think that might be a feature of some of the respondent surveys. And of course, if you're interpreting it as growth rates, uh, it would affect your results. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Of course, we have to we have to take it that the, the survey respondents are answering the question that was asked. But I, I do I do take that point. I think that is something the CBI do have a they go out and ask their respondents every so often. You know, questions that try to find out what did you what what question did you think you were answering when you answered those questions. So so we do have an idea about the limitations of of some of the responses, but of course that we we've not taken that into account in this analysis. That's certainly true, but it's a good point. Thank you. Okay, that's um that's it for the question. So uh, I guess it falls on you, Kevin, to close the session. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, yeah, I'll close the session. I, I thought that was very good. I thought it went very well. Of course, um, it is possible for people to carry on talk, talking in the lounge. And obviously, um, I'd be very happy to receive any comments by email, and I'm sure uh, the other speakers would too. Uh, can I also um, encourage people to go to the, the poster sessions that are going to happen this afternoon, where um, speakers will be able to talk about their posters. That's something that ESCO are keen keen to happen. But otherwise, I'll, I'll draw this session to an end. And thank you very much, everyone, for your questions.